Okay, so let's let's get started. Um, my name is Glenn Keller. I am a uh, longtime information technology executive. I'm currently um, IT director at Countrymark Cooperative in Indianapolis. It's an oil and gas uh, cooperative. And I'm going to be talking to you about STEAM and how STEM and the arts are interrelated. And uh, but Gina is going to kick us off and tell you, you know, about her findings. And uh, she's going to she's going to tell you what she, a little bit of what she does and how what her viewpoint is on this. So Gina, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Glenn. I'm really excited to be here with everybody today. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so that you can see my slides. And let me maximize this. Okay. So the title of my presentation, STEM versus STEAM, why does it matter? My name is Gina Covarrubias, as Glenn announced. I'm currently an engineering life coach. I have my own coaching practice, practice which is called Deliberate Doing. Here's a quick outline of what I'll be talking about today before Glenn goes into his slides. And the main question I'm going to answer is why should STEM professionals care about STEAM? What does ARP have to do with STEM? After a brief introduction of myself, I'm going to cover in sections two and three, two very big myths that a lot of us have grown up with in most of our lives. And that will lead us to discussing art and STEAM and what that actually means. And I'll wrap it up with a conclusion. About me, I am a former aerospace engineer. I graduated from Purdue with my bachelor's in aerospace engineering. I also have a master's degree in mechanical engineering. And most of my experience was in the corporate world although I did actually have experience in academia as well as working for the federal government, all in the aerospace industry. And a couple of years ago, I left my profession behind and I decided I wanted to make a different dream come true and one thing led to another and I discovered what life coaching was. So I created my own life coaching business, which is called Deliberate Doing. And what I've done is I've, I've married my engineering experience with my life coaching certification. I've combined the two. And so what I do today is I help STEM professionals get out of career confusion or a career rut. Many professionals, and this is not just unique to STEM, but many professionals end up um, asking themselves, what am I doing in life? What is my purpose? I kind of don't really know where I want to end up or I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And a lot of professionals have a lot of uh, confusion or questions around their futures. Now COVID has really brought on um, additional heartache for a lot of professionals because even if you're not getting laid off, you might be working next to people who are getting laid off. And it's, it's bringing up a whole nother avenue of career confusion. And what I'm learning with my clients is that COVID has really only exacerbated existing issues and emotions and insecurities that already existed. It's very easy to blame something like COVID for causing you to feel negatively. But what I'm finding is that those issues are already there. It's just that COVID is bringing things up to the surface and it's making people deal with issues that they haven't wanted to deal with in the past. Moving on, let's talk about myth one, your brain. Left brain versus right brain. How many of us, as we were going through our grade school and junior high and high school, were told about this theory that we are either left-brained or right-brained? There are a whole lot of students who actually fall somewhere in between. And so I think that this could be a very dangerous message that we're telling our students, because if you are left-brained, that must mean 
well, you have to be either a doctor or an engineer or something technical. And if you are deemed to be right brain, then that must mean you must do something in the arts and get a liberal arts degree. And this is very dangerous, I think, because we're, we're boxing people in at a very young age and they don't know the difference. Um, they're not old enough to necessarily understand for themselves that they don't have to be one or the other. So what I want to say about this myth is that it is true each hemisphere can act as an independent entity and it is true that each hemisphere may have a different style of processing information according to psychology but the truth is is that for um, a healthy functioning adult each hemisphere works together to execute a common goal and this is analogous to you working on a team at work to reach a common goal. You go to work and you perform your function and your own tasks, but at the end of the day, it's the cumulative effort that people put together to create a result. And that's the same way that your brain works. Activities and tasks are not necessarily cut and dry. They don't necessarily fall into the right or the left. And that's also true with your work. So I think we've all been given tasks that have been maybe a little bit ambiguous, or there have been issues at work that needed to be resolved, and maybe nobody could quite figure out whose responsibility that is. Okay, so this is a collective uh, effort. So I, I really wish that we would stop teaching our children, you are either one or the other. Let's talk about the next myth, which revolves your career. The myth is that your career should be fulfilling. I don't know how young I was when I heard this, and I've received messages throughout my whole life. I suspect many audience members have as well. But some of these messages, which I've listed here at the top, are that if you study hard and you get a good job, you're going to live happily ever after. Another message is that your coursework directly applies to whatever job it is you're going to get, or that you need a degree in X in order to do that job. And then the last one here at the top that I mentioned, that your job should be fulfilling, that if you work hard, you're gonna find this dream job. It's just out there waiting for you. You just have to find it. So these messages that we have been fed throughout our lives, um, can be very dangerous and they can be very counterproductive because if we get out there into the world and we believe all of these things to be true, what happens when we can't find it? What happens when we can't resolve some of these messages that we've been sent our whole lives? What happens is somebody either blindsides us or we have to learn the hard way that, hey, maybe there is no dream job. Maybe things are not working out uh, the way that I thought they were supposed to work out my whole life. And that could be a very dangerous position to be in because then it makes you want to resent your job. You might feel boredom at work. You might be really frustrated with your employer. You might hop from one job to the next, to the next, to the next, looking for that perfect fit because you believe it's out there. You might have regret. You might question yourself and, and ask yourself, where did I go wrong? How, there's got to be more to life than this. What am I missing? So again, these messages at the top, and this is just an example. There are others. But some of these messages we've been told and that we've believed our whole lives can come back to haunt us. So it's a very big myth that your career should be fulfilling. The truth here is that it is not your job's job to keep you happy. So your happiness, your intellectual stimulation, your development, whether it's professional or personal, that is all on you. That is your responsibility. Nobody else has your back. It's not anybody else's job to make sure you are intellectually stimulated. It's nobody else's job 
to make sure you are on the right path or that you are continuing your development. You need to be accountable to yourself. So this is a message that I, I wish somebody would have told me way back when, even back as far as high school, because I didn't know this. And so I went through a lot of my years in my career suffering unnecessarily because I was looking for things and I was expecting things that were not out there. So what I've learned is that it's up to me and it's up to each of you to create your own path moving forward, whatever that looks like. So your employer is under no obligation to furnish resources to you. Now, if they want to help you with professional development and training and any other kind of assistance, that's great. But you shouldn't expect it. Rather, the very last bullet on the bottom, I suggest you utilize the most powerful tool that you have available to you, which is your brain. And that's what I do as a life coach with my clients, is I help them understand the power of their own brain, and I help them understand how the ways that they've been thinking and how their perceptions are causing them unnecessary pain. So I like this picture because it represents what I do as a coach. Basically what I do is I go into their brains and I make them hit that reset button. And so they can start from a clean slate and figure out how to move forward in their lives and be happy at the same time. Here's section four. This leads us to STEAM and the arts. It, this here is a picture of a fractal. Um, fractals, uh, I just learned about these recently. I didn't study them in school. They are amazing. I highly recommend each of you look up fractals. That's F-R-A-C-T-A-L. And a fractal is a pattern that repeats itself to infinity. And Fractals are amazing because they're found not just in science and math, but also in nature. So what happens is you take the most simple system, the most simple process, or the most simple equation, and you keep repeating it. You use the previous output, and you keep repeating this pattern, and you get a fractal. And fractals are found in hurricanes, galaxies, rivers, trees, blood vessels, seashells. They're absolutely amazing. And I think that they are a wonderful blend of science and math and art all in one. So this is one of my favorite pictures I found. It's just a stock photo, but um, I wanted to show it and, and point it out to you because, because these things are amazing. They're just amazing and they fall right into the STEAM topic. So STEAM as a solution. Let's talk about that. STEAM promotes creative thinking. And creative thinking is the ability to consider something in a brand new way that you never would have thought about before. And here at the top, I've listed a few different examples. Problem solving and thinking outside the box and ideation and being open-minded, being organized and, and believe it or not, communication um, has a lot to do with creative thinking. And at the bottom, I want to stress that creative thinking is really, really important, not just to you, but to humanity in general. Creative thinking allows us to explore and discover and to challenge ourselves and to fail and get up and try again. And all of that results in evolving. And that's our whole purpose here on earth is to evolve. Part of what evolving means is to create new neural pathways up here in your brain. And you don't create new neural pathways by being comfortable, by sitting back and doing nothing, and by not pursuing education. And that includes arts, especially for us STEM people. Arts may be a little bit foreign to us. And that's especially why it's important to pursue art. So creative thinking and creativity is really nourishment for your brain. Your brain really likes it. And you don't have to be good at it. That's not the point. The point is to take yourself on a journey and go through a process that makes you learn. That's the whole point. And on this slide, what I wanted to do is show you all the different ways that art can show up in our lives. Visual arts, there's applied arts, 
there's performing arts. Now, when I was growing up, I was very much into STEM. And to me, art meant drawings and paintings. To me, that was art. So now I know better and I'm old enough and I'm more educated enough to know that art involves so many different facets of our world. And I'm gonna show you a couple of really neat pictures that I've taken with my cell phone. Clearly I'm not a photographer, so please excuse my artwork coming up. But I want to open your brain up to the idea of what art actually is. It involves everything listed here in this table and so much more. So in conclusion, engaging in the arts in addition to your STEM career promotes both sides of your brain. It activates problem solving. It enables you to be creative. It enables you to learn about yourself, create those new neural pathways in your brain, and it helps you balance a STEM career, which most of you in the audience probably have a STEM career that is um, heavily geared toward the technical side of things. And the arts really helps you balance that out in your life. And arts help you fulfill your life because once again, you're not supposed to get fulfillment from your job. If you do, that's, that's okay, that's fine. Just don't depend on it because jobs come and go. A job is just a temporary relationship that you have. So bottom bullet here is that it is your obligation to yourself to enhance your own creative thinking to create a well-rounded and fulfilling lifestyle. And I had to throw this picture in here because I have very conflicted feelings about this picture. On one hand, I look at it and I tell myself there is no logic behind this picture. I don't know what the artist is trying to tell me. Nothing makes sense. But on the other hand, I tell myself, this is somebody's creation. This is an idea that I never would have thought of. And you know what? Art doesn't have to be logical. And that's okay. That's okay. I want to leave you with two really neat pictures that I've taken with my cell phone once again. This was uh, last summer. I took this at a cousin's wedding. And behind this Coke bottle, you will see the real wedding cake. This is the actual picture of a wedding cake that the bride made for her own wedding. And the theme of the wedding was Coca-Cola. And I had to take a picture of that. I've never seen such a thing in my life. It was as tall as a traditional wedding cake. And she made it all by herself. I have no idea how she did it. but she did a phenomenal job and it is it's a work of art it's gorgeous and it was challenging i'm sure and it's just amazing the last picture i want to share with you is a picture i took last june this was in banker's life field house i took my 17 year old niece to a concert and um, it was a different kind of concert than what i'm used to there was a lot of performing arts in this type of concert and they dropped this moon at one point and kept it out and I just thought wow that's really really creative and they did such a good job creating that uh, I was amazed I, I was really impressed with that being said I'm going to stop sharing my slides and Glenn is going to pick it up with his presentation because he has some really really cool slides and some really neat people to talk about screen. We go here okay let's all right i'm sitting here operating this thing and in the back of my head i'm saying don't press the end button don't press the end button don't press the end button <laughs> so that's where i am with this but uh, okay, let me get my slide view. Okay, I'm going to take it for granted. You can see my you can see my uh, presentation, Gina. No, we cannot see your presentation. I, oh, I didn't select it. There we go. There we go. Now we're good. Yay! Got it. Okay. Which um, are you seeing the full screen or the half screen? Full screen. Yep, you're good. Okay. So. 
let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, just to a little bit more about myself, my name is Glenn Keller. Uh, I see a lot of familiar um, names on the in the, the uh, attendees list, but a few I don't know. So just kind of my background because it's a little bit relevant to what we're going to talk about. Um, I graduated from Augusta Military Academy in Fort Defiance, Virginia, that was my high school. Uh, we won't go into why I wound up there, but that's what happened. Um, and um, I have a BA in theater from Anderson University here in central Indiana, and then an MA in computer science from Ball State University. And I've been a leader in the IT space for about 36 years. And all of that functionality has been in corporate America in, in either the energy or manufacturing. Um, industries, and I like to uh, I like to write and speak on the side, and I like to think I can ski, but um, uh, I can probably ski better than most of you, with one exception of the person I know is on here, and that's all that matters, right? It's like, how good are you, Glenn? I don't know, better than you. So that's um, that's my skiing story, and I don't play a musical instrument, so I'm going to talk a lot about musicians uh, in my talk, but I do not play an instrument. Just so you know, I'm not pushing musicians. So, who's this? It's Art Garfunkel, math teacher. Who's this? It's Brian May of Queen, astrophysicist. Who's this? It's Hedy Lamarr, right? Star of Samson and Delia, a whole lot of other Hollywood movies, uh, physicist. George Washington Carver, artist, right? He's actually a famous, I mean, he's got a lot of legit art out there. If you, if you ever Google him, I mean, the guy could have been an artist versus uh, an agricultural scientist. So that was just reinforcing to start off with some of the things that Gina just said. And I'm bringing in my friend at this point, just to underline the point that um, Gina made about uh, what we think about right and left brain. And I'm gonna be a little stronger than Gina about it and say, you know, is bull. It is bull crap, 100%. And it's not just, um, a, uh, you know, you see it on Facebook quizzes and things like that. It's not this harmless little distraction we have. It does real damage to illustrate that. So there's a group called PISA, and uh, I've got the acronym spelled out later if you want to look at it. Um, but they, they specialize in doing educational analytics around the world. They surveyed U.S. school children, and they asked them, what does it take to be good at mathematics? And the U.S. school kids said, overwhelmingly, it takes talent. You gotta you got have talent to be good at mathematics, otherwise forget it. Well, then they turned around and they asked Chinese school children the same question. And what the Chinese kids overwhelmingly said was, you gotta study. Come on, math is hard work, you gotta study hard at it. Um, you just don't cruise through mathematics. So if we're starting off with that orientation, is it any wonder why our math scores look like this? Right, and there's the PISA if you wanna see the Program for International student assessment. If you want to look that up, if you're in education, and I know some of you are, they have all kinds of good information uh, about the education systems around the world. Some of it really surprising. So somebody that has known about this concept about STEAM for a really long time has been the Navy, not just the U.S. Navy, but that's what we're going to focus on because we're homers. But we'll start with the U.S. Navy. This is the battleship USS California, pictured in 1941 sinking into the mud after being bombed by the Japanese during the attack on December 7th. Now, besides losing a capital ship and losing a lot of firepower, the Navy had another problem going on here. Now, we've got 1,200 sailors that we don't know what we're going to do with. I mean, we're going to need them eventually. But what do we do for the short term with these 200 sailors? Well, there was another group at the naval base that needed help really bad. And they, they had no question whatsoever. They said, hey, we could use some help, send us the band. And so they sent the band from the USS California over to a group called Station Hypo. Station Hypo was the US cryptological effort on Pearl Harbor. These sailors became part of the team that broke the Japanese naval code. This led directly, and I mean really directly, to the victories at the Battle of the Coral Sea, which gives some credit for saving Australia, and the Battle of Midway, which gives credit, which you, you give the Battle of Midway credit for turning around the whole war effort, essentially in the Pacific Ocean. So that's what these musicians from this band on this ship were able to accomplish. So staying with the Navy, this is um, 
This is a, a shot from the battleship USS Wisconsin firing off its 16-inch guns. So what does a 16-inch gun do? Well, it fires a shell that weighs about 2,500 pounds, um, you know, similar in mass to a small car. It's going to take that shell and it's going to throw it 25 miles over the horizon past the curvature of the Earth. And just to give you an example of what's that, what that's like, we'll talk about Indianapolis since that's, that's where we're sitting right now, uh, most of us anyway. Um, so let's pick a suburb, let's say Sheridan. Sheridan, Indiana is about 25 miles from downtown Indianapolis. You're going to fire a shell from Sheraton, Indiana into Monument Circle, which is right smack in the middle of Indy, and you're going to try to hit Monument Circle. There's only one small problem. Monument Circle isn't standing still. It's moving around. It's jig-jagging. It's going up and down with the waves and tidal motion. It's doing everything it can because it does not want to get hit. And oh, by the way, you're on a moving platform that's moving around erotic, erratically, doing the same thing that Monument Circle is, because you know why? You don't want to get hit, because Monument Circle is firing back. So basically what you're doing is you're hitting a, you're hitting a pinprick from 25 miles away. And you got to deal with all kinds of things. You got to deal with weather. You got to deal with humidity. You got to deal with winds aloft versus winds on the surface, um, wave action, all of that. And you're going to hit that post of size dot. Do you think there might be some math involved in that? This is a picture of a fire control computer um, from a World War II era uh, fighting ship, a battleship. And as you can see, you know, it's kind of a computer in name only. It's got a bunch of knobs and stuff you turn. Uh, but it's, it's really, really complicated. It's not like you push the button and feed in the number. It's, it's, it says, hey, point it this way, and you'll hit it. It doesn't work anything like that anymore. And then what the Navy knew is they knew that the fire control people that manned these computers, that figured out how to aim these guns, to hit those targets, overwhelmingly were found in the bands. So if you looked at a World War II ship, and even in some cases, present-day ships, most of the people in fire control come from the band. So that's what the Navy has always known. That's where it's recruited them for, or recruited them from. So I had a funny story, because I gave a version of this talk once a couple years ago. Guy from the audience comes up afterwards. He says, you know, gives me this look like, hey, so uh, how'd you find out about fire control? And I'm thinking, oh, crap. This guy's going to tell me he's in the Navy, whatever. So I, like I told him, you know, I studied, fascinating, whatever. And, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, what do you do? And he says, well, you know, I was in the Navy. I was a fire control officer. I'm like, oh, great. And so I said, okay, well, did I at least come close? And he said, oh, no, no, you were spot on. You got it right. You know, we shook hands, started to walk off. And so then I, I said, hey, wait a minute. I said, did you play an instrument? And he said, oh, yeah, I played guitar. I said, but we all played instruments. Everybody in fire control. So even as, you know, and this guy obviously was not in World War II. He's probably maybe old enough to be in Vietnam. I don't know. But um, that tradition and that recognition continues to this day. I promise I'll get off the ships eventually because uh, we're going to sink this one in a minute. Um, but this is a picture of the, uh, the battleship Bismarck, the pride of the German Kriegsmarine during World War II. So, you know, you like to think of, um, you know, the British as stiff upper lip, they don't get emotional, you just buckle down. Well, when the Bismarck sank the HMS Hood, there were over 1,400 sailors on the HMS Hood, only three survived. The British just went nuts. You know, Winston Churchill is giving speeches. We got to find the Bismarck. We're going to sink the Bismarck. The, the whole Royal Navy was after this thing. And, you know, if you listen, if you watch the movies, listen to the popular stories, you know, the, 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 the story goes something like this. Well, you know, battleships hunted it down. Destroyers, you know, shadowed it. You know, we lost it a few times because of fog. But eventually we cornered it. And the HMS Royal Ark launched some torpedo bombers. You know, they hit the steering mechanism. All it could do now is steam in circles. And then eventually, you know, HMS, you know, HMS uh, Rodney and some other battleships came along and sank the thing. Well, that's only part of the story. Because battleships like the Bismarck are really fast. And it's running away. And you're not going to catch it if you don't know where it's going. Right? You just can't. It, you're, it's, it's way too fast for you. So in order, in order to catch it, you had, to, you had to have an intercept course. So you had to be able to get in front of it. Well, the only way you can plot an intercept course is if you have some idea of where it's going. And this is where Jane Fawcett comes in. Um, and this story wasn't told until recently. And I think it's probably because it was classified. Uh, 
the, the British have um, their, their, uh, their, their intelligence agencies tend to classify things much longer than US intelligence agencies. So I think this is kind of a recent find within the past 20 years or something like that. Uh, but Jane Fawcett was a mathematician. She was bilingual. She was, of course, a musician, and she was a code breaker. She had a special job in the code breaking unit, though. She did what was called traffic analysis. And as a traffic analyst, one of her jobs was to look at patterns of messages and figure out which message is worth decoding, right? Because there's way too many messages to decode. So she found two interesting messages and said, hey, let's decode these. These look interesting. So they decode them. The first message is from an officer on shore to the Bismarck. This guy is worried about a relative on the Bismarck. He knows they've been fighting, wants to know how his relative is doing, and it says, hey, how's this guy doing, or whatever. The second message was from the captain of the Bismarck back to shore saying, hey, don't worry. Uh, everybody's fine. We're going back to the base in Brest, France. Boom. That was the end of the Bismarck, because now we knew where it was going. So goodbye, Bismarck. Okay, told you no more ships. Okay, so this is uh, Maria Sibelia Miriam. She's a German woman, and David Attenborough called her among the most significant contributors to the field of entomology, the bugs, right? So why was she so significant? Why was she so significant that for years the Germans had her on the 500 Deutsche Mark bill? What was so important? What was important is that she could illustrate I mean, this is an era where you didn't walk along and say, oh, this is an interesting bug. And you pick out your iPhone, take a picture of it, and you upload it to uh, you know, Purdue University Extension Service. And they say, oh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. We think that's new. No, you had to be able to illustrate and draw it to show it to the world. And as you can see, her illustrations were just amazing. And this is just one example of those illustrations. Continuing along those lines. Ada Lovelace, computer visionary. And if you're, in the, if you're in the IT field, which many of you are, you recognize her name. She even had a computer language named after her called Ada that the Pentagon knew. Side story on Ada, um, somebody once quipped that the best thing about Ada was that the Russians stole it, but you know, it wasn't that successful. But she was. She was also, uh, besides computer, computer visionary, she was a harpist, uh, she was a guitarist. Also mm, a bit into the occult, so a little bit of a weirdo, but you know, sometimes uh, that goes with the territory. Okay, now I'm just piling on when I start throwing out stuff like Franklin, right? Franklin, obviously a scientist, officer, author, philosopher, uh, inventor, musician, right? All of that, already know that. But what's his most famous, or what's his favorite invention? His favorite invention is something called the glass harmonica. So this is a musical instrument that he invented. You spin it around with the treadle and you move your fingers over on it, around on it and it makes different sounds and it actually is, sounded quite nice according to people. As you can see here, this is a version that's still extant. There's a piano bench there, there's a microphone, they're getting ready to play it for some sort of concert or demonstration. But there's a number of these things still in existence and still in use uh, around the world. This is Dr. Mae Jeminson. Uh, she entered Stafford, Stanford 16. She graduated as a chemical engineer. Um, she also became a physician at this physician at the same time, because what the hell, why not? Um, um, and she's also an astronaut, dancer, and actress. Now, interesting thing about her was her first love was she wanted to be a dancer and actress, but then NASA gave her a call, and she had a conversation with her mother, and her mother said, basically, are you out of your mind? Um, you can do all that other stuff if you want, but NASA calls you to be an astronaut, you go be an astronaut. So, art imitating life, later on in her career, she actually did get to play an astronaut on TV. So this is, uh, this is her appearing in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. And bonus points to you if you know the job that she's doing, and it means you're a real Trek nerd. Um, so a little bit getting back to me and how I wound up in this, you know, a former boss of mine asked me this question. He said, how did you go from military school to theater degree to computer science and all that? He just, he just he was kind of freaked him out a little bit. Didn't make any sense. So we already discussed, I'm not gonna talk about how I wound up in military school, but I was for seven years of my life. Um, but the, the, the thing, okay, the, the thing about this journey, and I, I don't really, um, I don't really wanna blame it on women, but Charles fault. Because as I started going through this, and you'll see I have a, a number of women sprinkled in the presentation, 
and, and that's really just because kind of the influence um, that this has had through my whole career or that they've had through my whole career. So first of all, the reason I got to military school is my mother. She's like, you gotta get out of here. Um, and you need to go somewhere where there's less, because I was surrounded by her and my aunts, right? You need to go somewhere where there's some men in your life that are gonna smack you in the back of the head when you need it and basically straighten you out. That was kind of that story. Um, so then um, in military school, we're out in the middle of nowhere and you know, there's no girls. And the only, the only way to meet, well, there's like four different ways to meet girls. So the first way, first way is it could be like really blazingly handsome, uh, which that's not gonna happen to me, so we'll eliminate that. So there's, other, there's three other ways, right? You can be in French club. Um, you can find an excuse to go to church in town because there'd be some girls there, or you know, you could be in place. So French club is boring, that wasn't gonna work. Church worked too well, it had to bail. And so then, you know, then we get into plays and somebody asked me to be in a play my senior year in high school and one of the professors said, hey, you know, you want to be in this play, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hey, it looks like there's a lot of girls. Fine, I'll be in this play. So I was in that play and then I went to college. And because like most people in college, I had to make a choice on a major and I was having fun being in plays. So I continued to be a theater major. And, you know, this, this went on for a while. And um, I was going to graduate as a theater major, and I was going to be a poor something or other as a theater major until um, my roommate, who I know is on the call, and I won't mention your name, uh, my roommate and I, who was also a theater major, and I, we had this conversation and went something like this. Hey, we both need a science elective, and we had one, there, there was one overriding goal among other, every, other, um, every other criteria. And that was, it couldn't be in the morning because there was no way we were going to get up to go to a class early in the morning. So eliminating everything else, that came to computer science class. So we wound up taking computer science class. We heard it was hard. Uh, predictable results for both of us beginning. I think he may have got his act together a little sooner, but eventually I did uh, as well. And I, I remember um, towards the end of that course, the, uh, the professor who was teaching the course uh, came up to me and she said, hey, um, you seem to be really good at this. You seem to be spending a lot of time working on it, et cetera, et cetera. And she goes, why don't you think about doing this as a living and you know, forget that theater stuff. Um, and I was doing well at it because I was spending a lot of time in the computer lab. Um, now, what she didn't know, I was spending a lot of time in the computer lab because I had a crush on the lab assistant. And so that was kind of how that was going down. But you know, still while I was there, I had to do some work. So I was, doing pretty, I was doing pretty well in the class. So I talked to her, and uh, if somebody from college wants to know who that was, I can tell you who that was offline, by the way. Um, so I, I'm talking to her, are you nuts? I've got a theater degree, this is my senior year, I can't go get a degree in computer science. And she's basically, her advice was, well, it was so much advice, she pretty much told me, said, hey, I want you to go over to Ball State, I want you to talk to the department chair. I'm like, how am I going to get in? It's like, she said, don't worry about it. I've worked it out already. Just go over there and talk to him. You're already in. So basically, I just had to show up and brief. So that's how I wound up starting my real career in computer science. But I will tell you this. It was the theater degree that got my first job. Because I remember uh, the hiring manager after, you know, my first day, and he's talking to me. He said, hey, you know, we really like, you know, Ball State grads and all that, and they did have hire a lot of Ball State grads. And um, said, but you know, that's not what really made the difference. And we were really interested in this theater thing um, because we're just kind of interested in seeing how that's going to go. We love the combination of the two. Let's see what you can do with that. I was like, okay. So that got me my first job, really. Uh, I might have worked somewhere else eventually, but that was kind of how I wound up working there. So in case you think that's a one-off. Let me tell you a story I heard at a convention maybe five, six years ago. So I was listening to the CIO of a really, really large defense contractor. This guy has 5,000 IT employees reporting to him. So this is gigantic. And he's telling the audience about how they go through resumes. He said, well, the first thing we do is we look for the very best technicians. So if you're, you know, I mean, they have the cream of the crop they could pick from, right? I mean, this is like Wall Street to MBAs, right? And, Everybody with a technical degree would love to work at this firm. And he just take the very cream of the crop of technical degrees, proficiency, 
designated skills, et cetera. So that is who we chose to interview. But there was one more cut. After that, we went through and we picked all the people with a liberal arts background and we threw everybody else out. So if you're not in the IT field and you're not familiar with big defense contractors, let me tell you, these are jobs that start at six figures. These are meaningful jobs. And I mean, I, you know, hey, I love coding academies. I love trade schools. They help lift, lift people out of poverty. They're great. But if you did not have that liberal arts background, if, you, if they didn't think that you were a well-rounded individual, you were not getting into this company. And that's still a trend today. And it's not that long ago, it's five, it's five years later. So all I'm saying is, hey, coding academies, all those things are great. Um, but you know, at some point, they only take you so far. So given that, what we just said, given that we know from studies that young music students outperform their peers in mathematics. How come music teachers and resources at the in the nation's most economically challenged schools are underfunded? Why are we narrowing education, right? So here's my, here's my first call to action for you, right? Let's stop using junk science like this left brain, right brain. Right. In fact, help me out. Every time you see it, even if it's just a stupid Facebook quiz, call BS on it, will you? Because it's, it's just dumb and it does damage. Let's stop telling kids what they can't do. That's just idiotic. I mean, we're telling people, in, kids in first and second grades after standardized tests, well, you know, we don't think little Johnny here is going to be all that good in math. Well, why? Because he couldn't move three blocks around in the stupid test we just gave him. Oh, come on. You know, he's not concentrating. He's sick or whatever. Uh, and let's level up that math is hard. I'm sorry, you know, you may be able to cram for a lot of subjects um, at the last minute. And trust me, I am an expert at cramming for stuff at the last minute. But try that with a mathematics course. It's not that it's hard. It's just that people are not putting in the necessary work to get through it. And so kids say, oh, I'm not that good at it. And the parents are like, oh, my kid's not that good at it. And so we're not disciplining them to do it. We're not cracking down on them and saying, look, you can do this, just get to it. It's a lot easier to say you're not good at it. And let's make sure people do art, right? Whether it's a performing arts, visual arts, whatever it is. Look, if they do ballet and dance, they're gonna learn teamwork, right? They're gonna learn time management. They're gonna learn attention to detail and they're gonna learn self-discipline. Um, if you go to like any ballet school and I've you know, worked at ballets where I've done stage lighting and ran the auditorium for them and stuff, you just see the kids that are not on stage, they're down in the audience with their school books or they're practicing a routine and there's nobody cracking the whip over them. They just know they gotta get their studying done at some point, right? It's mostly high school kids. If you're into music, you know about timing, you know about counting, you know about fraction. Look at a sheet of music, it's a different language, especially if you don't read music. Come on, look at a conductor score and tell me that's not a different language, right? How about in theater? You learn leadership, you learn electronics, you learn working under pressure, you learn coordination. Look, there's this thing in the software industry. It's like, don't be afraid to fail, minimal viable product, which is all that's another word for just throw it out there and see if the customer complains, which they almost always do complain, right? And so you bring it back and say, oh, you know, well, that was the beta release or we put a patch out or whatever. In theater, you do not, in theater, opera, whatever it is, ballet, you don't get a do-over. Right? If it's eight, if the show is gonna be at eight o'clock on Saturday night, the show is gonna be at eight o'clock on Saturday night. And it's gonna be good or it's gonna be suck or it's gonna suck. And during the course of the show, if you screw up, you gotta wing it. So and so just skip three pages of lines. Well, you gotta figure out what to do. Right? You gotta bring that person back three pages, or you just gotta wing it and make something up. Sometimes it doesn't always work out that well, but you move forward, right? If you're still not convinced and maybe some of you are still not convinced, members of the National Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society, which is the British equivalent, are twice as likely to participate in arts and crafts as the general public. Nobel laureates are three times as likely, but maybe you don't want your kids to be Nobel laureates. It's not right for everybody. Being all that extra money and fame, who needs it, right? So something I know that 
I'm going to hear it. I hear it all the time. Yeah, but a liberal arts education is a well-rounded education. Go ahead. It's way too expensive. We don't have time for that. It costs $100,000 plus to go to IU. Oh, horse crap. Look, all of these are viable alternatives to get an education. IU Kokomo, Purdue, you know, Purdue has a, an online thing going on with Kaplan University. Uh, for Ivy Tech is a great, that's the, if you're not from Indiana, that's the Indiana Community College System, Western Governors University. And look, on their first two lines up there, and these things are way less expensive than going and living on campus at some place like Bloomington or West Lafayette. And I'm gonna tell you, that IU degree from Kokomo and that Purdue University that's coupled with Kaplan, hey, after you get your first job, all anybody's gonna see is IU or Purdue, two prestigious universities that are Big Ten universities. That's all anybody's gonna know. Um, and you know, as for Western Governors and Ivy Tech, I'm gonna tell you, this applies to everything. You know, a year into your career, nobody really cares where you went to college except to give you a hard time whether you're from IU or Purdue or, or, or Virginia or Virginia Tech or whatever. But some of you want to insist on having the full college experience for your children. And I mean, that's fine. If you want to do that, it's out there and you can pay for it. But just because you want to do that, don't tell me that a liberal arts education and a well-rounded education is too expensive. Because this is not education you're paying for up here on the screen. This is experience. And it's kind of a sketchy experience, too. So uh, now I'm going to give you some real world examples that are here, um, both in um, the Indianapolis community. And I know we have some people out from Virginia, so you'll see one of those um, as well. Uh, so this is Jeff Tan. Um, and first, I'd like to give, before I go into Jeff, I'll give him a little shout out because uh, the NDCIO network that he, uh, that he operates and founded. Uh, really helped push this presentation out there, so I do I do appreciate that, Jeff. He's letting us use a time slot uh, that's normally reserved for ending CIO. So let's talk about Jeff a little bit more, though. Jeff at one time was the CTO of the year, uh, Chief Technology Officer if you're not in, in tech. Um, he's the founder of the Indy CIO network. Um, also has to, happens to be a speaker, an author, an explorer, uh, a historian, and a musician. And if you get Jeff started on Lewis and Clark, um, you're going to really hear some great stories because Jeff is a Lewis and Clark expert. I mean, like, got in the RV, followed the trail, the whole thing. But Jeff does a lot with Lewis and Clark in terms of bring to bear leadership lessons, and he's a great speaker. Uh, and this particular picture is from uh, Montana in, from, from the State House. I want to give one other uh, kind of, I guess, a plug for Jeff. Jeff just wrote a book. Jeff is a prolific writer. Uh, he's just written his second book that's just released, um, and I believe you can get that on Amazon for Kindle and a lot of different, a lot of different forms, but it's called um, Amplify Your Job Search, and I highly recommend it. Um, and it, it kind of goes a little bit with some of the things we're talking about here uh, today. So Amplify Your Job Search, go out and get it. Um, this young lady's name is Lorena Lane. Um, she calls herself a STEM artist. Now, I, I met her at a um, at a STEM event for young people, and you know I'm helping set up tables. I'm seeing her setting up across the way. I'm gonna put up this thing called STEM artist, and I'm like over there, like holy crap, what you know, what are you, what do you do, blah blah blah. So she's giving me her story. She's actually a sociology major, uh, but she also likes design, so did a lot of graphic design work, and so she did illustrate and all that stuff. Uh, but so she does all that, but then she decides as a hobby. I'm gonna teach myself mathematics. Then she decides, well, great, I understand all this math, so I gotta do something with it. So then she teaches herself astrophysics. So she's kind of all this stuff plus astro, astrophysicist on top of all of that. And here is uh, some of her work here uh, that she's done over the years. And you can go out to think, thinkartprint.com or uh, ampersand thinkartprint on Instagram to see some of that work. This is a friend of uh, a friend of some of ours named Marsha. Uh, Marsha was Senate page um, when she was the age to be a Senate page. She was an English major in college, but also has her MS in computer scientist. She plays violin, cello. Uh, at one point, she was a soloist with Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And she insists that I put Pastry Chef on here. She was like, don't forget Pastry Chef. OK, so Pastry Chef is on there. Also happens to be a cybersecurity expert. Um, 
So interesting thing. So what a little story about Marsha. Um, when she was in university working in grad school, um, and I, I'm not going to try to explain this to you, you can Google it later, but steganography, it's basically the art of hiding um, text within images uh, or detecting text hidden within images. So her and a colleague at school, fellow student, just for the heck of it, decided to write an algorithm uh, to help find some hidden messages in, in artwork. And being that she was in the art, the Washington DC area at the time, uh, let's just say there's some people that kind of habitate that area, took kind of an interest that had some influence on the arc of her career, and we'll just leave it at that. This is uh, another friend of mine, a former colleague, Carl Zemlin. Uh, Carl is a mechanical engineer, photographer, uh, also an audio engineer, and he owns his own business, uh, Zemlin Photo. This is a picture uh, that Carl took. As you can tell, he's an amazing uh, photographer, also is a, one of the official photogs at IMS, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and he's got some amazing pictures of cars, race car drivers, and, and also the, the Red Bull Red Bull air races that used to be out there. So before I talk about Jill, I just want to point out that Carl also took this um, this photo. So he, you know, he does just doesn't do animals and race cars and stuff. He also does people. And I think this is just an amazing picture of Jill because if you know Jill and I know Jill and some of you do, I mean, if you look at the facial expression on on Jill's face, you know, that's you that says everything about Jill. Um, she is the vice president of marketing and business development. She's got a BS in marketing, uh, graphic design, a CRM expert, um, and in 2016. She was named to the Tech Point uh, Tech 25. That's for the top 25 young uh, tech, uh, rising technical stars in, uh, in the Indianapolis area. So Jill used to work on my team um, when in a former employer, we were just chatting around one day. We had, an, <clears throat> we had hired her to do some system administration work, which she was doing while she was in college. And she started talking about her graphic design background. So we started messing around and say, hey, why don't you look at a few things? So this is one of our corporate slides at the time. Uh, I took the name off the slide, but uh, what, without the name, it absolutely says nothing about what we do. It's our cover slide. Uh, so this is the cover slide we always use for every presentation. Jill said, that's crap, and kind of designed this. And I think this says a lot more. And you can just see the beautiful design and the imagery about what we do that was floated out there. So my message to you here today, if you're hiring, you're leaving talent on the table. Not everyone in tech needs a tech degree. Uh, again, if you're a hiring manager, you need to change the recruiting tactics. And if you're a parent, perhaps you need to change where you're trying to get your kids to apply for jobs at. Try a little training. Um, it seems somehow, you know, companies today figure, you know, hey, somebody's gonna show up on my doorstep, completely trained out of college, and I'm gonna turn them loose. When I started my degree, and I know some of you are on here from that first job I had, uh, they didn't let us touch code until they trained us for you know, at least two or three weeks because they're afraid we break something, and they're probably right, we wouldn't. So not everybody's big on the arts. This guy, according to how you define success, Stalin, really successful leader. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe you're fine being like Stalin, but you know, just didn't really think too much of the arts. So just kind of a little fun extra here. Uh, I like doing this, kind of lining up people together. So we got Jeff and Brian. Uh, we got Marsha and Ada. Uh, we got Carl and Ben. Uh, we got uh, Jill and Jane. Um, and then we have Lorena um, and uh, May. And I'm going to close uh, with Albert Einstein, who said the greatest scientists are artists as well. And you may not know, but Albert Einstein was a violinist. And if you want to break down that saying a little bit, the greatest scientists are artists as well, let's just think about it this way. He's saying the best scientists are artists as well. He's saying good scientists are artists as well. He's saying, if you even want me to take you seriously, you're going to do art. I mean, that's the message he's giving you. Hey, everybody, thank you for your time and attention. Here's my contact information uh, if you need to get a hold of me. And uh, I believe Gina's going to send the deck out to you on hers too. But uh, thank you for your time and attention. And I'm going to turn this back over to Gina.
All right, great. Thank you, Glenn. And I do have to say, um, Glenn has a blog. He recently started, I think over the summer, perhaps you started it. Uh, yeah. I've read some of your stories. They're always, always very entertaining. Uh, so I highly suggest people check out Glenn's blog. Uh, two things I'd like to end with, uh, unless Glenn has anything else he'd like to say. Um, please submit any comments or questions in the chat. Um, and while you're doing that, uh, the one thing I'd like to say is that this uh, presentation was recorded and after I upload it to YouTube, I will be sending everybody a link to the recording, uh, just in case you'd like to rewatch or share with others. And the second thing I'd like to say is, if you are experiencing some real career heartache right now, or if you know somebody who's going through a really tough time with their career or maybe having been laid off, I always offer coaching up front for free. Just tell them to get a hold of me. My website is deliberatedoing.com, or they could send me a note directly, gina at deliberatedoing.com. That's G-I-N-A. I'm happy to talk to people if they just want to bounce ideas off me, or if they just want an unbiased person to listen to them. I'm game. That's what I do. <laughs>